All right, we're going to go ahead and open up to Ephesians. I'm, I'm back in Sunday. This is Acts. We're going to go to Acts. Uh, we're in John 5, but what we've kind of done a little detour here uh, is we're taking the things we learned in John 5 uh, and the book of John as a whole and John 5 in specific, that's the chapter we just finished, and we're applying what we learned there uh, to the ministry of Peter and the Twelve in early Acts. Remember, one of the Twelve is John, and what do you suppose he's teaching at Pentecost along with Peter and the others? Uh, I don't th doubt he was teaching things that eventually uh, he put into this Gospel of John. So he's teaching these things at Pentecost. Uh, and so he, we're going to take what we learned in chapter 5. So that begs an important question, what did we learn in chapter 5? At the last third of chapter 5, what we learned, Jesus explains that the reason why the uh, bulk of Israel, the majority of Israel, doesn't receive and believe him is because they don't really believe in God, the scriptures, or Moses. If they really believed in God, they would uh, receive and believe in the Son. The Son, remember, in the middle part of, of John 5, he explains, I only do the works and I only speak the words of the Father. Uh, and so if they really belonged to the Father, if they really believed in the Father, they would recognize the Father and the Son and they'd believe in the Son. So the, uh, Paul, or John's point there uh, is the, Jesus is making clear there uh, that the reason they don't believe in Jesus is because they don't really, really believe in the God, the Father. They don't believe in uh, Jesus because they don't really uh, believe in the scriptures. They claim to, but they don't really because the scriptures testify of him. And they don't really, even though they claim to be followers and believers in Moses, uh, they don't because Moses wrote about Christ. And if they believed in God, if they believed in Moses, if they believed in the scriptures, they would believe in the Son. The corollary then of that is those who do believe, receive and believe the Son are those who already belong to the Father. They know the Father, so they recognize the Father and the Son. So that's a great principle, and that's what we're going to bring out uh, in, in early Acts here. It brings out this overriding concept that John isn't particularly and especially of Christ coming at this exact time to engage in personal evangelism and individual salvation. Uh, what he's done is he's come at this time uh, to uh, bring about Israel's national salvation. Uh, and that's what we have to keep in mind. And the same thing, my point is here, is the same thing as that, that's, gonna, that's going on in early Acts as well. Uh, and uh, what I'm trying to do is get us to dive a little deeper uh, into the scriptures. Uh, for the last decades, I've been taking things that just have never really added up in my mind uh, and research them as thoroughly as I can anyway uh, and have written about them. And I'm bringing those into my teaching here uh, at GBCRM. All my goal is to get us to plunge more deeply into God's word. Uh, to, think about things. I'm not just going to parrot uh, whatever, what you can read in any other book or what you can find any place else. I'm especially stressing things that just don't make sense through the traditional teaching uh, and looking at options to that to bring us more fully into God's Word. And one of the things I will uh, say is one of the things that uh, I think a lot of Bible's readers miss, and if you think about it a little while, we've been taught by our own vain religious system that everything in the Bible is all about us uh, in, our, in our immediate situation. Uh, we can just go in, take whatever we want, don't have to worry about context, or anything. If it says Jerusalem, well, throw out God's word Jerusalem, put in your hometown. If it says uh, David, throw out God's word David, put in your, your name. Uh, if it says Israel, oh, what a joke. Obviously, God never intended to a literal physical Israel. You got to put in your name in the body of Christ, spiritual Israel. Uh, see, that's the way we've been trained uh, to think about the scriptures. But when uh, we come to the scriptures to find 
find out what God's really saying and try as best we can not to throw away his words and statements and keep them there uh, and try and determine uh, their meaning and context, uh, we end up with quite different conclusions uh, than when we treat it lightly and throw away his word, just make it mean whatever we want it to mean. And one of the ways we do that is we forget about these transition periods in the Bible, in Israel's history. Uh, be, uh, in Israel's history, there were many transition periods, but I just want to talk about two here today. And Bible readers see them. I've had a lot of correspondence on this over the past few weeks. Uh, and uh, one of the common themes is a lot of Bible students, Bible readers have a hard time uh, thinking about, uh, uh, even those who rightly divide the scriptures have a hard time thinking about these transition periods. According to Webster's Dictionary, uh, a transition is a change from one state to, or uh, subject or place, but we'll use the phrase state, one state to another, usually occurring through a process. Uh, and so if we want to take that, there's been many times in Israel's history, we're going to just look at two and then bring that into our study of Acts, uh, two great transitions, we'll call it in the New Testament, uh, one in the Gospel accounts and one in the book of Acts. Now, of course, we know the Gospel accounts really are Old Testament, but let's not get into that technical side. We'll just use traditional language right now. Uh, and in the gospel accounts, well, actually, it might be better to start with number two here. I should have probably had that numbered first. Uh, we in the uh, grace movement, the mid-Acts dispensationalist movement, uh, have no problem with this translation or transition. Uh, or we have a problem, but we understand it fundamentally and basically. And that's the transition that we're very familiar with from God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel to his mystery program for the body of Christ. Uh, we talk about that transition a lot. We actually call it the transition period. Uh, the transition period uh, happened uh, as God, be, Acts is gonna begin uh, with everything centered on Peter and the 12 and the, and the uh, prophet, God's prophetic program with Israel. The Israel's gonna once and for all reject it. God's gonna set aside, cast away Israel temporarily, set aside his prophetic program, put, the king, her, put Israel's kingdom in abeyance, and that program's gonna diminish uh, and he's beginning <clears throat> begin a new program through the Apostle Paul, his mystery program for the body of Christ, and that's going to increase till it's the only show in town. Acts starts with the only show in town being Peter and the Twelve and God's prophetic program. It ends uh, some 25 years later or so uh, with Paul's mystery program for the body of Christ. That's a transition. Now we're kind of familiar with that because we talk about that all the time. That's one of the fundamentals uh, of right division. But uh, what I want to talk about today especially is there's another transition uh, in, uh, in the New Testament uh, and especially in the gospel accounts but also in the ministry of Peter and, and the Twelve. Uh, and that's the transition uh, from those Jews living under, uh, be, or let me put it this way, living before Christ's earthly ministry and those Jews living after Christ's early, earthly ministry. Uh, there's a transition there. Uh, there's an important transition there, there uh, as God transfers. He's going to change, move, believing, especially believing Israel. You know, the Jews, the bulk of the nation is going to reject them. We just learned this in chapter 5 because they don't really believe in God. So who are the ones that are going to receive Christ? They're the ones who believe in God. They're members of the believing remnant of Israel. Uh, those are the ones that are there before Christ's earthly ministry. Uh, Elizabeth and Zacharias, uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, John the Baptist and most if not all his followers, Simeon and Anna. There's a whole believing remnant. God's always promised Israel he'd preserve for them a believing remnant. And they are the ones Christ has come now to call out of unbelieving Israel. Uh, and so they were there, their lives, they might have had 20, 30, 40 years of their lives happen before Christ's earthly ministry. They didn't know anything about him. They didn't know a person named Jesus. Uh, and and they, there was nothing, uh, it was impossible for them to know about it because it hadn't happened yet. 
then Jesus comes on the scene, uh, especially with the beginning of his earthly ministry. Uh, and now uh, God moves uh, th those believing Jews, hands them over. God the Father hands them over to God the Son so that he can instruct them and preserve them and prepare them for the coming wrath, that tribulation period, uh, and entrance into the kingdom. So there's a transition period there. Uh, uh, the people who went through these transitions uh, had a unique problem that we don't have 2,000 years ago. Here's one of those things where we can learn from these transition periods, but they don't really apply to, directly, at least, and specifically to us today. Uh, they went through these things, and uh, see, we've had 2,000 years without any divine transition periods. Uh, ever since the uh, raising up of Paul, ever since uh, this, uh, co uh, this complete setting aside of God's prophetic program with Israel and the, the only show in town as being God's mystery program for the body of Christ uh, made known through the Apostle Paul. There's been no, for now 2,000 years have gone by and there hasn't been another transition. We've been 2,000 years in the same thing. So they had a problem that we don't have. They have to change. They have to be brought from one state to another. Uh, for, uh, for back in early uh, in Acts, would be, it was a change from Peter and the Twelve to Paul and the prophetic program with Israel to the mystery program with the body of Christ. But there was one previous to that in the gospel accounts. Those who were believing Israel in Israel before Christ's earthly ministry lived out maybe a great part of their life not knowing anything about Jesus. And then Jesus comes on the scene, uh, and the Father is going to transition them to the Son. This is what I'm going to call in-between people. See, we're not in-between people. We've had the same divine program for 2,000 years since, the, since Paul. So th these, this, we haven't had any transitions to deal with. But these people did. Uh, not only the one in the gospel accounts, they were the believing remnant before Christ came on the scene, uh, and the believing remnant after Christ came on the scene. The believing remnant before Christ came on the scene uh, in relationship to the Father, now the Father is going to hand them over to the Son. And that's what we see happen in the gospel accounts. Uh, people who began in one state then needed to transition to another state. And as I said, uh, no one since 50 or 60 uh, AD, depending on how you count, how you count it, uh, has lived in a divinely originated transition period. It was unique to those people. Uh, there were some transition periods before that in their further back history, uh, but there hasn't been any in the 2,000 years since. Uh, and everyone since Paul uh, has born, been born in and lived through their whole lives and died, of course, barring the rapture, in only one state, uh, and that's Pauline Grace. Believing Jews who lived during uh, and immediately after Christ's earthly ministry were born and partially lived in one state, like Anna and Simeon, uh, jo Mary, Joseph. We've been through the list a hundred times. If you need some concrete examples of who were members of the believing remnant, uh, then Christ came on the scene and God moved them to another state. Remember, over and over in the gospel accounts and John, he keeps talking about nobody comes, Jesus says, nobody comes to me unless the Father leads him. The Father's going to lead those who already belong to him. They're already believers, and he's going to hand them over to the Son so he can prepare and preserve them as they go through the wrath and for entrance into the kingdom. Uh, the gospel, and these are what Luke calls, I wrote a paper this last week uh, about the Luke's devout people. These are what Luke calls devout Jews, true believing Jews. They belong to God. They believe in God. God counted their faith for righteousness. Uh, and uh, in, uh, Christ is going to come, he came, and God move, is moving them to the Son. 
the gospel accounts introduce Jesus Christ to all the Jews of the world uh, as or early, or excuse me, the gospel accounts to the, the, uh, introduce Jesus Christ to Israel, the Jews in the land of Israel, especially to believing Israel. Let's go to John 131. John 131, and we'll see this, uh, John the Baptist tells us. Uh, And we can stay in John 1 because we're going to come back here. So don't turn back to Acts yet. Stay here uh, because we're going to look at another verse here. But look at John 131. Uh, John the Baptist says, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So he comes to manifest the Lord Jesus Christ. That means, uh, you know, the week or the month before, nobody knew anything about Jesus Christ. Now, John the Baptist and Jesus himself makes himself manifest. You have a change in states. There's a change in the situation, uh, a transition. Uh, Early Acts does the same thing, except in early Acts, Peter and the Twelve, where Christ uh, and John the Baptist and Christ were primarily manifesting Christ to uh, the Jews, especially the believing Jews in Israel. Peter at Pentecost is going to be manifesting Christ, especially before believing Jews from the Gen- who live among the Gentiles, what's called the Diaspora, uh, especially believing Jews. From there. He's going to p- pronounce it before all the Jews that come. Uh, from the diaspora, uh, but who are the ones who are going to receive it? It's going to be those who already believe in God, the devout, he calls them devout, we're going to look at that, uh, the devout Jews from the diaspora, the devout Jews who were living among the Gentiles come to town and he's going to manifest Christ to them. Christ manifested, uh, or John the Baptist manifested Christ to the Jews in Israel, lived in Israel, Uh, Now, Peter is manifesting Christ to all the other Jews uh, throughout the world. These believing Jews had lived their whole lives out there in in Asia and Rome and Italy and Africa. They would come from all around Arabia. They come from all around. They'd lived out their whole lives not knowing uh, who this man Jesus was. They've never heard of him before. He just showed up on the scene. It's not their fault they haven't heard of him because he just showed up on the scene. Now they knew uh, through Peter's preaching they needed to believe and follow him for he will instruct and preserve them, as I said, through that coming uh, wrath uh, and safely into the kingdom. Uh, What's happening is the father is handing over to the son those who belong to him for safekeeping. These in-between people who lived in Israel during uh, the transition from the state that existed before Christ's earthly ministry to the state that existed after his earthly ministry, uh, it's important to realize that at his first coming, uh, there were those uh, who in Israel who were members of the believing remnant of Israel. Sometimes we get the idea uh, because we've been taught that uh, John is basically the greatest book of personal evangelism and individual salvation, uh, that we, we think that there were no believers in Israel before Christ came. And then Christ came and he starts saving unbelievers. Uh, but that's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. God had always said, he promised Isaiah, he promised Ezekiel, he promised all the prophets, he promised uh, David in the Psalms. He would always preserve a believing remnant in Israel. And he always has. And there was a believing remnant in Israel before Christ came on the scene. Those are the ones that are going to get, the Father is going to transition over to the Son. They had already believed in and belonged to the God of Israel, uh, God of Israel uh, and Father uh, and the Father. Uh, like Abraham, they believed God and God had counted their faith for righteousness. That's the way all individuals are saved before God, by faith without works. Abraham believed God, God counted his faith for righteousness. And here you have a believing remnant of Israel. They, before Christ ever arrived on the scene, they believed God uh, and his promises to Israel. 
and God counted their faith for righteousness. They have individual salvation and forgiveness of all personal sins. These are the people like, uh, as we said, I listed them out before, Mary and Joseph, Elizabeth, Simeon, John the Baptist, uh, all these people. And it's important to notice John the Baptist tells us explicitly when he's, he's already carrying out his ministry. And while you're, hopefully you're still here in John 1. Uh, look what he says in verse 31. We just read this verse, but I want to point this out. He's going to say two times in three verses that he didn't know Jesus Christ. Look at verse 31. And I, John the Baptist, knew him Jesus Christ, uh, I, I, and I knew him not. Then we'll go two more verses down, verse 33. He reiterates, I knew him not. He tells us there. And that's more startling uh, when we remember John and Jesus were cousins. So obviously he doesn't mean here I didn't know him as a person, as a, as a human being. He didn't know him uh, as the sent one of the Father. He didn't know him as the Christ, the Messiah, the King. Uh, he didn't know him uh, from that standpoint. Is anyone going to say uh, John the Baptist wasn't really saved? No, of course he was. Uh, but there's been a transition. There, he was saved before Christ arrived on the scene. He believed in God. God counted his faith for righteousness. Now Jesus arrives on the scene and John says, I didn't know him. I didn't know. Is anyone going to suggest, as I said, that John the Baptist wasn't saved in the sense of justified before God, individual salvation? Of course not. Like all other believers, uh, and they needed to go uh, from one state of not knowing Jesus to the state of knowing Jesus. A transition. A transition. Uh, and since they were just finite, uh, dull-witted humans like us, that takes time. That takes time, and therefore, that's why you have uh, in the gospel accounts uh, and carrying over into the ministry of Peter and the Twelve and Early Acts, you have uh, this time when uh, John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter and the Twelve are manifesting Christ to Israel, making sure they know God has advanced his program with the, his prophetic program with the nation of Israel uh, and uh, by sending his son to fulfill all the promises. That's what they're being introduced to. John didn't know it before. That doesn't mean he wasn't a believer, he wasn't unsaved. Is it because it's just Christ just arrived on the scene to explain it? Or the Father just revealed it to him eh? uh, so he knew who to baptize and everything. Uh, so uh, there's been a transition. They, they, Christ didn't primarily come to make unbelievers in God believers in God through him. Now that's great when it happened. That's been happening all the way since the fall of Adam and all the way since the days of Abraham. People believe God. God counts their faith for righteousness. What Christ was sent at that time to accomplish was to call out the, the believing remnant, those who already belonged to the Father, and take charge of them uh, and usher them into the kingdom. It was time to fulfill, to make them participants of Israel's national salvation. John explains this succinctly uh, in, when at the close of his earthly ministry, now I go to John 14, this is really a key verse and it's key on the one hand since it's so simple, it's so short, anyone can memorize it in two seconds uh, and it says, yet it says everything. John 14, verse 1. Let not your, now this, remember, this is the end of his ministry. He's with his closest apostles. Uh, he's ready to go to his death. He's going to be betrayed shortly, go to his death on the cross. It's at the end of his ministry, basically. And he's got his closest apostles here with him. And he says, you, uh, ye believe in God, now believe also in me. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> 
we all got to be shaking our heads with that verse, right? I thought they believed in him way back, at least in chapter two, with the changing of the wine to uh, changing of the water to wine, and even and perhaps also in chapter one when they're confessing who he is. Obviously, that's not believing in Jesus unto individual personal salvation. They already had that. Uh, the, what's going on here is this transition. They're in between people. Uh, they were, they've lived out most of their lives before Christ came on the scene and didn't know anything about this man named Jesus. Jesus arrives on the scene and carries out his earthly ministry, and now he makes himself known, uh, and now they're in the transitioning process uh, to understanding who he is, what he's going to do, uh, and to follow him uh, and believe in him. They already believe in God. They already are individually, personally saved. Now they need to believe and follow the Son, and he'll usher them into Israel's national salvation uh, and uh, separate them from all Israel's national debt of sins so that he can make of them his own great, holy, debt-free nation in that kingdom. The primary point, again, as we've, we've said over and over, uh, but it's worth taking a little time on this because there seems to be a lot of interest in it. Uh, the primary point here uh, of the Gospel of John is that God was handing those who belonged to him over to his son. Uh, he's the prophet. Remember in chapter 5, John 5, that's what we're all springing off here. We learned uh, Jesus is the son of the father and son team that's going to carry out the Davidic covenant. And what's the Davidic covenant? It's the promises of God whereby he's going to save and restore the nation of Israel. It provides for Israel's national salvation. He's the son of the father and son team that's going to do that. We also learned in John 5, he's the prophet like unto Moses that's going to be raised up in their midst. Keep all these in your mind because when we go to Acts, uh, hopefully uh, is your brain is going to be like popcorn because all these things are going to pop up again. And they needed to honor the son, chapter 5, as they honor the father. Uh, to honor the son is to honor the father. You're going to see that again in early Acts. All these things. John is one of the 12, remember? Uh, and he's going to go and he's going to be preaching at Pentecost alongside Peter. And no doubt he's going to be preaching the things that eventually end up in his Gospel of John. Uh, those who believed in uh, God would believe in the Son. Those who believed in the Scriptures and Moses would receive and believe in the Son. Uh, those who believed uh, in God uh, were to now believe that Jesus uh, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing they would have <clears throat> take possession of the life they have for life and living in the kingdom by falling on the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name. Uh, that's the purpose statement John gives uh, in John 20, 31. And so now with all this, we're going back to Acts. With that background, keeping in mind we're still dealing with in-between people. Uh, now he's going to especially deal with in-between people, uh, the Jews uh, from outside the land of Israel, who come uh, to Jerusalem, to Israel, and, and end up in Jerusalem f uh, for the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, and so let's go ahead and turn uh, to Acts 2. Uh, but let's just start with one caveat. Uh, this is another help. Uh, for your Bible study. So that's all I want to do. If I can give you some helps to Bible study so you don't have to be enslaved to theological systems or religious systems uh, for, uh, for your uh, knowledge of God, uh, we can go to the scriptures and if we're trained not to throw away all the God stuff and put in what our theology system says. Uh, we, here's a couple examples of things that are very important. Every time, we're going to use them here in Acts, but every time you see these words or phrases, you should stop. You remember that song, Stop and Smell the Roses? Well, I'm going to say stop and ask a question. When you see phrases like, or words or phrases like saved, save or saved, salvation, when you see a phrase like forgiveness of sins, uh, what you need to do is you need to stop and smell the roses. You need to just take, don't skim through it, don't keep reading, you need to stop. And you need to ask a question. What salvation? What are these people being saved from 
and being saved unto. What is it? You can be saved from anything and saved unto anything. Remember, I gave the example. A couple of people commented on it, so if it worked, if it impressed, uh, it seems like a simple example to me, but maybe that's the whole point. It made the point. I walked into a room and just heard this lady say, I saved her family. She saved her family. Now, in my, it, I, it's out of context because I didn't hear any of the other news story. Now, am I supposed to assume she like pre was saying in that news article that she preached the gospel to her family and they all believed and they became saved? Obviously not. I sat and listened a little longer and she, uh, you get some of the context and she, it turns out she saved her family uh, from financial ruin by getting a job. See, you can be saved from anything. Uh, you can, you can be saved unto anything. You got to have a context to know what you're saved from and what you're saved to. What salvation you're talking about. Paul's sitting in jail in Philippians and he's waiting to be saved. Are we supposed to read from that, that Paul wasn't saved yet? Individual salvation? Of course not. He's had that for ages. Uh, he's waiting to be saved from his predicament of sitting in a jail cell uh, and to be set free. So when you get saved in salvation, forgiveness of sins, you need to stop and smell the roses. You need to take a break. You need to ask the question, forgiveness of what sins? You can't always, just because it's in the Bible, assume every time you see the word saved uh, or forgiveness of sins, that it's always individual salvation uh, and personal forgiveness of sins because that's not always the case. Uh, they're just generic words and phrases that you have to find out what they're talking about from the context. Uh, they m might refer to individual salvation and forgiveness of personal sins, but they might also refer to another salvation like Israel's national salvation, and they might refer to a different set of sins, uh, namely Israel's national debt of sins and Jews and Israelites associated with that national debt of sins just because they're Israelites. What's true of the Gospel of John is truly in, true in early Acts. Uh, so we're going to go through quickly through the first couple of points because we developed these uh, over the, the last couple of weeks. So but we'll let's just start at the beginning here uh, and we're just going to skip a stone over this because we dealt with this. Uh, verse 5. He's, uh, verse 5, we, we already read the background, uh, the, the, the Christ just pouring out the Holy Spirit, they're speaking in tongues, the rushing wind, all this stuff, uh, and verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under the heaven. And I wrote an article last week that went through Luke's use of devout uh, people, and it always refers to people who are justified before God. They already have individual personal salvation, just as a basic synonym uh, for devout. Anna and uh, Simeon and Anna, I include Anna because it's part of the same passage, it's only specifically said of Simeon, but he's called devout. And then Luke explains that by saying uh, he's just, he's justified before God. Uh, and devout people, justified before God people, Jews in Israel and outside Israel, Jews everywhere, uh, are waiting for the consolation of Israel, i.e., the salvation of national Israel and the redemption of Jerusalem. Now keep that in mind because when Peter starts talking, he's going to talk about those two things. That's what devout people are waiting for. Devout people in the land of Israel are waiting for Israel's national salvation beginning with redemption in Jerusalem. The Jews outside the land of Israel are waiting for that as well. And the God-fearing Gentiles associated with the Jews, the devout God-fearing Gentiles associated with the Jews are waiting for that as well. Luke covers them all as in, this, uh, in early Acts here. So this devout concept, uh, don't just skip over it. Uh, it's not devout like we sometimes use the word. You know, if some guy sits on a flagpole, we say how devout he is to his, to his, uh, his thing, whatever he's focused on. Uh, it isn't someone walking to a church and crossing themselves and we say, oh, isn't she devout? Uh, this, it's not, 
when Luke uses the word devout, he's talking about devotion to God. These are true believers in God. He's not talking, using the word the way we use the word today, sometimes. Uh, he's devoted to God uh, and he's justified before God. Uh, just as Jesus taught in uh, John 5, 37 to 47, he knows that for the most part, those who respond positively will be those who already believe in God. That's what we learned in John 5, the last third of John 5. Those who, uh, therefore, when they hear Peter preach about the Son, they recognize, they are gonna rec there's going to be some that recognize the Father in the Son. And they will receive the Son, believe the Son, and follow him. And now let's go ahead and pick it up in our Acts account, uh, verse 16. Uh, I just want to point out one or two things because I think we did actually get this covered. We won't actually go to Joel except for one thing. We are going to go to Joel. I take that back. We are going to end up back in Joel. Uh, the, he's going to talk about the, what's happening here is according to the prophet of Joel, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass that in the last days, and he's going to read through the whole prophecy. We, re we read through it and looked at it last time. Uh, and verses 16 and 18 uh, are a quotes uh, from Joel 28 to 29. Christ baptizes believing Israel, uh, those who believe in God and have received and believed in his son. Uh, there, it's his, his handmaidens, his own people. Uh, he baptizes them with the Spirit. Uh, this is what is happening now at Pentecost, a foretaste of Christ having his, saving his friends, believing Israel and those believing Gentiles associated with them. Then in verses 19 and 20, he's going to bring up the wrath concept. Uh, let's look at verse 19. And I show you wonders of heaven above, signs in the earth above, blood and fire, a vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So here you have two aspects. It's beginning to be fulfilled. Uh, the whole, the, God is pouring out the Holy Spirit on the believing remnant of Israel. And what's coming next is the wrath upon all unbelieving Israel. And of course, we, uh, we're going to begin with that great and terrible day of the Lord. It goes into that tribulation period, especially the last three and a half years of that uh, tribulation period. Uh, and that's what's coming next. And of course, Peter's point is, uh, you better participate in the baptism of the Spirit because the only other option is the baptism of fire that's coming next, the baptism in, with wrath. But now what I want to focus on is Joel 2.32. 2, 2, so we will go back to Joel. Joel 2.32. It's after Hosea, if that helps. It's before Amos. Uh, Joel 2.32. And this is really the key verse uh, for this prophecy. This is why Peter brings it up. This is why Peter brings it up. Uh, it gives Peter's purpose uh, for this whole thing. Uh, chapter 2, verse 32. Joel 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Well, who's going to be calling on the name of the Lord? It's the, the one ones who receive the Spirit. Uh, and, and which he just discussed in the verses before this. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. What's another word for deliverance? Salvation in Jerusalem is looking. Uh, this is a prophecy that has to do with the salvation of Jerusalem, deliverance of Jerusalem. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Uh, who is he going to be calling out? He's calling out a remnant. That's the believing remnant. That's the devout Jew. Of all the Jews that came from around the world, some people uh, say there might have been a million Jews uh, in Israel and Jerusalem, uh, would travel to Jerusalem in, at this time, which would mean and if two-thirds of them, if Jerusalem's population tripled, uh, two-thirds of them uh, were from Jews from outside the land. That means maybe there's 666,000 uh, Jews from outside the land, and some of them were devout. Some of them were true believing Jews. 
members of the believing remnant of Israel. Uh, and just like in the land, there was a believing remnant outside the land, believing Israel outside the land. And here, Joel's prophecy puts on display the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and the coming wrath and the call those who call upon the name of the Lord, who fall upon the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name, are the ones who are going to participate in Israel's national salvation beginning with the salvation, the deliverance of Jerusalem. Now, what did Acts 1.8 say? We won't turn there. Remember what uh, Jesus told, commanded them? He said, go to Jerusalem first. Stay there and the, wait for the Spirit uh, and then go to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, well, uh, here we have why he's going there. Why he, well, of all the prophecies Peter could have used, why does he use this one? It's because it's what he's doing at Pentecost is what Christ did in his earthly ministry and what he's doing here at Pentecost. He's calling out the believing remnant from among the unbelieving Jews and bringing them unto himself. They're the ones uh, that will be calling on, receive the Spirit, call on the, name of, uh, call on the name of the Lord, fall on the grace resident in his I am Jehovah name, and he will fly them into on his wing, eagle's wings, uh, and fly them into the kingdom and bring them to himself. That's what Peter's talking about at Pentecost. Uh, and he uses Joel's prophecy because that's exactly what he's talking about here. He's appealing to the believing remnant of Israel. He convicts the whole nation and broad proclaims it to the whole nation. But who, based on our John 5 principle, who are the ones who are going to receive Christ? They're the ones who already believe in God. They're members of the believing remnant of Israel, and God is going to transition them from God the Father to God the Son so that he can bring them into Israel's national salvation. All who call upon his name, the grace resident is I am Jehovah name shall be saved. Uh, those are the ones that receive the Spirit, uh, and we need to stop here. Now let's go back to let's go back to Acts. Pick it up there. Acts two, verse uh, twenty-one. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now hopefully everyone stopped and smelled some roses, because we need to stop and say, saved from what? Is he talking here about individual personal salvation? Absolutely not. <laughs> You've got to get it from the context. What is he telling them they can be saved from? The coming wrath, the blood fi fire and vapor of smoke, the great and terrible, notable day of the Lord. That's what they can be saved from by uh, believing in the Son, receiving the Spirit, uh, and they, he, they will uh, preserve and protect and lead them uh, through the tribulation period and on into the kingdom to participate uh, in Israel's national salvation. Saved uh, from this evil, uh, saved from the coming wrath. And look how this whole passage uh, is encapsulated in two mentions of save. Flip over a page if you have to to verse 40. Acts 2 verse 40, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward, this evil generation, unbelieving Israel, unbelieving Jews in the land, the nation as a whole, and the unbelieving Jews outside the land. And he's call, Christ was calling out the believing remnant within the land. Peter's now calling out the believing remnant uh, outside the land. Uh, and uh, they're going to receive the Spirit and they're going to be preserved through that wrath and on into the kingdom. Peter is introducing uh, them uh, to, uh, to the fact I guess I left a word out there to them, to the, the fact that God has advanced his uh, program with his prophetic program with the nation of Israel. He's pre advanced, he, there's been an advance 
in his prophetic program with Israel. These Jews, to remember his audience, two thirds of them uh, have been uh, from outside the land. We looked at the distances, they're from hundreds and thousands of miles away. And when we remember, there was no tweets and no Twitters, uh, there was no Instagrams, uh, there was no iPads uh, or iPhones, there were no uh, app, news apps that popped up news from clear across the world uh, the, almost the minute it happened. Uh, and they, if they knew anything about Jesus, it would have been extremely incomplete and probably mostly wrong. Peter, now they've come and Peter's going to tell them, give them a complete account of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and he's going, uh, a complete account of the Lord Jesus. And he's going to tell them about how God has advanced his program by sending his son. Sending his son. And Peter's announcing this uh, to, to, remember, two thirds of the audience are Jews from outside the land who wouldn't have known any of this, have no familiarity with it whatsoever, and what they did would be incomplete and probably wrong. Peter's going to tell them now about what God's doing, his advance and his program. He's convicting the whole nation and the whole household of Israel. Uh, look at uh, chapter 2 again, uh, and let's begin at verse 22. Ye men of Israel. And look how it's basically going to end down at verse 36. He says, now lest you think ye men of Israel, he's just talking to uh, the, na the, the nation of Israel. It's, he's not. He's talking, he's going to clarify or add to that verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel. That's every Israelite anywhere in the land or outside the land. Let them know. Uh, that God hath made the same Jesus you, that you've crucified. Now, just think about that. He's convicting the whole, not only the nation of Israel, but the whole household of Israel, every Israelite everywhere. He's convicting of putting their Messiah and King to, to, uh, to death on the cross. Now, most, and two-thirds of them in his audience weren't anywhere in town. They were a thousand, hundreds and thousands of miles away 50 days before when they put Christ on the cross. And they didn't know anything about Jesus. And what they knew was incomplete and wrong. Yet all Israel falls under Israel's national debt of sin because they're Israelites. The whole nation falls under this. All Jews everywhere as Israelites uh, come under this, fall under the guilt of Israel's national debt of sins, the sins that have been crewing for 1,500 years under the curses of the law and the courses of punishment, and especially the sins just recently of putting their Messiah and King and Lord uh, to death on the cross and Savior to death on the cross. Uh, and now let's go ahead and read a little bit here. Look what Peter says, uh, back to chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Uh, notice it's a man approved of God. Among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. Hopefully this, uh, you remember I said, hopefully our brains will be popping with popcorn because uh, there's everything he's talking about here is what we read in John 5. In John 5, Jesus explains he doesn't do anything on his own. He only does the works of the Father and speaks the words of the Father. Peter says Jesus came and speaking the words of the Father and doing the works of the Father, and you put him to death. But there's more than that. Keep reading. Uh, did miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him, in the midst of you. Hopefully there's some more popcorn popping. Because when we were in John 5, we spent a lot of time on the topic of the prophet like unto Moses, whom God promised Moses 1,500 years before he would raise up in the midst of the brethren. 
Peter says, God has, God was working in and through Christ. All Christ said was the words of God and did the works of the Father. Uh, and he's the prophet like unto Moses that God promised he would send in, in the midst of the brethren of the Jewish nation. He, that's who he is. Everything from John 5 is coming on here and there's gonna be even more. Uh, everything in John 5. And the question is, why didn't they believe? Well, you see, the answer is in the last third of John 5. Because they really don't believe in God. And they don't believe in the scriptures and they don't really believe in Moses. And he says, as you yourselves know him. So here in this one verse, we have uh, that God, Christ only spoke the words and did the works of the Father. Uh, and then we have, he's the prophet like unto Moses. God promised to raise up in their myths. Uh, and of course, a prophet like unto Moses, what would a prophet like unto Moses' job be? To lead them through a greater exodus uh, out of unbelieving Israel and the unbelieving world and usher them into the promised land of the kingdom. All that's in that one verse. And all that we covered in the middle part of John 5. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, this is all according to God's plan, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Uh, and so they've taken him, the one, if they, you see, if they believed in God, if they knew God, they would recognize that the Father in the Son and they would have received the Son. But instead, they rejected the Son uh, because they didn't believe in God. That's the principle from John 5. And they put him to death on the cross. Uh, God the Father had advanced Israel's prophetic program, sent his son to do his works, to fulfill his words, share his words, uh, and sent the prophet like unto Moses to lead them in a greater exodus. And they put him to death on the cross. But uh, and for us, it's good news, but it wasn't good news for Israel. But God raised him from the dead. You know, the guy you thought you got rid of on the cross? God raised him from the dead, loosed uh, and raised him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that death, sh uh, that uh, he should be holden of it. Uh, and we're not going to go through every verse of this, but he did the words and the works. He was the prophet like unto Moses. He, uh, Peter is uh, convicting the nation, but he's speaking especially to the believing Jews in the audience from uh, the other nations of the world. And believing remnant in Israel too, it says believing the believing Jews from every nation, and of course a lot more nations are in town for the feast of Pentecost. You read in, earlier in Acts two, Israel took the, Israel took God's sent one, His approved one, uh, and with wicked hands crucified Him and put Him to death on the cross. The bad news uh, of the cross, uh, and God raised, but God raised Him from the dead to rule the earth from David's throne uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, and he's convicting the whole nation, but the people, but those who are going to respond to it are those who already believe in God. They already have individual personal salvation. That's the lesson from John 5. They already belong to God. So when Peter, through Peter's preaching, they recognize the Father and the Son because they already know the Father. And then they'll receive and believe the Son. Uh, and he, Peter goes on to explain, give another aspect. What was the one thing I haven't mentioned yet? Well, I haven't mentioned a couple things, but the one thing I, major thing I haven't mentioned for that we learned in our middle section of John 5, uh, the, Jesus uh, Christ is the Son of of the father and son team that would fulfill the Davidic covenant. Remember in 2 Samuel 7, I think it's verse 14, uh, God promised to enflesh himself into the line of David uh, and enter into the line of David, into the humanity of David. Uh, and God the Father, uh, which would he would be the son to God the Father the father and son team to fulfill the Davidic covenant, John explains that the son that's there now, the Lord Jesus Christ and the one Peter's preaching uh, now at Pentecost is the son of the father and son team that's gonna fulfill the Davidic covenant. And what does the Davidic covenant provide for? 
Israel's national salvation beginning with the salvation of Jerusalem. That's what's going on at Pentecost. It's not a personal evangelism uh, meeting. If there were people there who didn't believe in God and they believed in God, uh, believed God's word through Peter, then they would be, he'd count their faith for righteous. They'd be individually, personally saved. But that's not the primary thing going on here. What's going on here is now those who already are individually, personally saved are qualified to participate in another salvation, participate in Israel's national salvation and national forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the son uh, of the father. Uh, we just went through that. He's now sitting. Let's just read a few things here. Uh, let's pick it up at verse 29. Uh, verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you uh, of, the patri of, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. God himself is going to flesh himself into the line of David uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, to, and he would be related to the Father. He's as the Son to the Father. Jesus Christ is that Son of the Father and Son team that God promised would uh, restore the, or save the nation of Israel. Uh, he's gonna, he raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, to sit on the throne of David. Not the throne in your heart. I know that's what our own vain religious says, gets rid of God's word uh, and puts in their theological mumbo jumbo. Uh, this is a literal, physical throne uh, of David in the literal, physical, delivered, saved Jerusalem that's going to head up uh, the, the literal and physical uh, saved and delivered nation of Israel sitting in the literal, physical Middle East, a plot of land in the Middle East. And that's what P Peter says. He's ready to begin doing this now. His, God's uh, prophetic problem with Israel, he's made a big advance. He sent his son now to do all this, to fulfill the promises, to bring about Israel's national salvation. He, uh, and he's speaking of the resurrection uh, and verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore being at the, by the right hand of the Father and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth uh, with this, which ye see now and here. He's, uh, Christ is baptizing with the Spirit his own people, that believing remnant of Israel, who also believe in Jesus. Now you got the believing remnant of Israel from the faraway nations who never heard of Jesus, or if they heard of him, it was irrelevant because it was wrong and incomplete. Now they've heard of Jesus, and now those who they already believe in God, John 14, 1, now Peter was appealing them, uh, believe in Jesus. And when that happened, they would now be brought into Israel's national salvation and forgiveness of sins uh, by believing in Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. He's now sit sitting at the right hand. When he stands up, he's going to bring what Joel talked about, that coming wrath and judgment. Peter is introducing the advancement of his prophetic program with Israel by sending his son. Now was the time for those who believe in God, John 14, 1, uh, what he, Jesus told the apostles at the end of his ministry, you believe in God, now believe in me also. Now you have Jews from all around the world, members of the believing remnant who believe in God. And Peter's uh, uh, explained to them the advance in God's program, introducing them to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's appealing to them, now believe in him. And those who believe in God are the ones who, in the group who are going to believe in the Son. They're going to recognize in Peter's preaching the Father in the Son, and they'll receive the Son. Those who don't receive, the vast majority who don't receive, 
Uh, they don't receive John 5, the last third of John 5, because they don't really believe in God, the scriptures, or Moses. Now was the time for those who believe, are now gathered from all the nations of the world uh, to be also believe in Jesus as sent one, uh, the greater prophet like unto Moses, his appointed one to usher believing Israel through another great, uh, greater exodus into the promised land of the earthly kingdom. Uh, he's the son of the father and son team that's gonna fulfill the Davidic covenant uh, that's gonna provide for Israel's national salvation uh, and redeem them from their national debt of sin. This is the salvation Peter is inviting them to. People who already are individually, personally saved are now being introduced uh, to the person they never heard of before or what they heard was wrong, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And through Peter, they're now going to believe in the Son and they'll follow the Son into that kingdom to participate now in another salvation, Israel's national salvation, and, and be separated from their association with Israel's national debt of sin. And we'll just close, because I see we're out of time. Uh, verse 36, we'll just close with verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel. This is the whole household of Israel. This is every, this isn't just Jews in the land. This isn't just the Jewish leaders. This is the whole household of Israel, Israelites everywhere. They were under, they were associated with the, the nation's national debt of sin. Not because they uh, carried it out. They were th hundreds and thousands of miles away when they put Christ to death on the cross. They were associated with it because they're Israelites. And they are associated with Israel's national debt of sin. They need, in order for God to make of the believing remnant his own great and holy uh, debt-free nation, the greatest nation on earth, they, he had to get rid of all the debt, all the association with apostate Israel, all that accumulated uh, debt of sins, be separated from all that, and he's going to give them the nation, it says uh, in, in Matthew, he's gonna give them the nation, make of them his own nation, a holy nation. Uh, righteous, uh, great nation, debt-free. Uh, and uh, they fall under Israel's national debt of sins. They were hundreds and thousands of miles away. They didn't have anything to do with what happened 50 or so days before. But they still are associated with Israel's national debt of sin because they're Israelites. Just like when America does something due, all Americans are associated with Israel's, excuse me, all Amer when America does something stupid, uh, the world looks on us uh, and uh, associates every American with America's national debt of sin. So too here, uh, just because they're Israelites, they come under Israel's national debt of sin. And if you want the classic example, this read the first half of Daniel 9, and you see Daniel there confessing his sins, our sins. But their sins Daniel didn't do. He was a good prophet. He's talking about idolatry and all this stuff. He didn't do any of that. He was under Israel's national debt of sins because he was an Israelite, and he needed to be freed from that. Uh, and Daniel's the classic example of that. This is what John the Baptist called on the nation to do in uh, Matthew 3, 1 to 12. And the basis for it comes from Leviticus 26, 40 to 42. Uh, and remember Leviticus 26 gives us the whole history of Israel in a nutshell and how they were going to escape uh, this national debt of wrath, judgment, and sins. All right, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer.